Hello, I'm Jameson Berry. I'm with Indiana Department of Labor and Safe Safety Consultant. I'm here to talk a little bit with you guys today about personal fall arrest systems. Some of the things we're going to talk about are the anatomy of a fall, uh, the components of an actual personal fall arrest system, the proper inspection, donning, maintenance, and use of them, and uh, calculating the total fall distance. I'm going to give you guys a lot of things to think about there, and going to kind of touch on rescue of a fallen worker, which I feel gets missed a lot. A few quick stats for you. I don't want to dig too deep into these. So just in Indiana, uh, 2017, there were 20 reported workplace fatalities due to slips, trips, and falls. Uh, that's an increase of 51% from 2016. Now nationally, uh, according to the CFOI, it's the highest level in 26 year history, uh, 887 deaths. Um, so that's a total of 17% of the fatalities in 2017. Uh, it's an increase of more than 4% from 2016. So just to kind of show you, it's still growing. So back here from 2013 uh, to 2017, there's over 150 more deaths due to these uh, injuries. So real quick on anatomy of a fall, you know, I used to climb cell phone towers back in the day and some of the guys, um, they didn't really see the need for the fall protection. They're like, ah, you know, if I start to fall, I'll just reach out, I'll grab a hold of this angle and I'll, I'll stop myself from falling. Well, it takes about two thirds of a second um, for you to become aware and to react to a fall, okay? So a third of a second, you fall on two feet, okay? And then another third of a second, so there's your second third, you fall on seven feet. So unless you're your inspector gadget, I really don't see you saving yourself from a fall. Not to mention the hulk of a grip you would have to have to be able to stop your body. So uh, it just goes on quicker from there. You know, two seconds later, you fall on 64 feet and you're done. So duty to have fall protection. Uh, OSHA has requirements for employers to uh, protect employees from fall hazards. Now, all the surfaces that employees work on, they must be inspected before work. And employees only permitted to be on surfaces that are strong enough to support them. Um, and the last thing there is, you know, employers must make sure the falls get arrested before an employee hits the ground. Uh, general industry and construction, they both have their own sets of uh, training requirements when it comes to fall protection. General industry, uh, before an employee isn't exposed to a fall hazard, it must be trained. Makes sense, right? Uh, training must be done by a qualified person. It must be trained on the nature of fall hazards, uh, procedures to minimize falls, uh, correct procedures for installing, uh, inspecting, and maintaining the personal fall arrest system, and uh, correct use of it. In construction, it's a lot of the same requirements. You know, all employees that are exposed must be trained. Uh, a little bit different is construction required to actually train the employees on the standard itself. And also each employee's role. Now, depending on what you're doing out in the field, there's different requirements. So if you're in general industry, you only have a four foot limit there. If you get working above a four foot above a lower surface, you need to have fall protection. Construction, they made it six feet. Now, if you're working on scaffolds in construction, it's 10 feet. If you're doing steel connecting activities, that's 15 feet. If you're, excuse me, if you're doing steel erecting activities, it's 15 feet. If you're doing connecting activities during steel erecting, it's 30 feet. So the ABCs of uh, personal fall arrest systems. So you have your anchorage, your body harness, and your connecting devices. These are all very important. But I want to add a D onto this for descent, rescue, and of a uh, fallen worker. I feel like that really gets missed a lot from the companies that I talk to. We'll give everybody their harnesses. We'll give them their lifelines. Um, but they don't always look at what's going to happen if somebody falls. How am I going to get the guy down? So looking at the A a little closer at Anchorage, um, all your anchors need to be rated for either 5,000 pounds or 3,600 pounds if a uh, if it's a rated anchor. Now, an uh, engineer needs to rate the anchor. It needs to go through testing and things of that nature. And then uh, the ANSI Z359 requires that the arresting forces on your body, if you do fall, be limited to 1,800 pounds. And we're going to kind of talk about that a little bit too. Now, your anchorage must be rated 5,000 pounds per user. Okay, so I love this photo here. I'm sure most of us have seen it. 
Um, you know, per user, if you want to look at that, we have 11 people there. That would have been a 55,000 pound anchorage capacity. Um, and they do that because there's a chain reaction. Okay, so if one guy falls, the shock from that may cause another guy to fall, which may cause another guy to fall, or, you know, might pull another guy over or something like that. And then each one of those falls are going to weaken the anchor a little bit. So just kind of like a visual thing. So if it's an unrated anchor, um, you've got a 5,000 pound capacity. And so you got to look at it and you got to say like, you know, would this hold 5,000 pounds? Well, would I hang my F-150 truck off of this anchor? If you're kind of questionable about that, then probably shouldn't be tying off to that. You need to find a better location there. You know, a couple of other examples there, 500 gallons of paint, 800 traditional bricks, 125 center blocks, 500 two by four by eight studs or two 18 foot scissor lifts. All those are examples of about 5,000 pounds. So if you don't think you can hang that off of that, I'll tie off to it. All right, they've got an anchor for almost any situation nowadays. Um, they've got anchors here for sides of block walls, peaks of roofs. They've got some now you can put on the back of your pickup truck and you can pull up somewhere and put a retractable lanyard on that. Um, the last one over there on the end is for standing uh, seam roofs. They've even got suction cups now that you can put on tanks and airplanes and things of that nature. Uh, this is for roof trusses when doing uh, framing work. There's another one, it's a trailer dolly. So just about any situation that you can find out there, they've got an anchor that will work for you. Um, falls are preventable, so you know, and if I can climb, you know, a few hundred feet up on a tower or, you know, any other, if I can frame a house and stay top, I don't see any situation where there's not an anchor that would protect employees. Um, things to think about when you're looking at your anchorage, um, you want to look at what's going to happen, you know, if somebody does fall, is there damage that's going to happen to the system? You know, is the anchor going to pull somebody across the sharp edge or some of the equipment across the sharp edge, something like that? So you kind of want to look at that and say, okay, maybe if I move my anchor over here, you know, there won't be as much swing and there won't be as all the sharp edges and things of that nature. Um, and then also you want to always read the direction. So if we go back here to, you know, this roof peak anchor. I've seen those before where they've only had like four or five bolts installed in or screws installed in. And that's not following the manufacturer's directions. So you always want to make sure you're reading the manufacturer's directions and installing them the way that they're supposed to be installed. So swing fall, but you know, you want to look at where you're placing the anchors. Okay, if this guy falls off the side of the roof here, what's going to happen? Well, he's going to swing over in the side of the building. Okay, not protecting employees from the injuries there. So you got to make sure you're supplying enough anchors to the employees and that they're in the correct location where you're going to prevent that damage. Uh, body harnesses. So the old days of just hanging you know, uh, John Doe, a, a harness and, and say, Hey, go, go work on this roof, go climb this tower, whatever it is. Hey, we got to make sure we're training these guys on the proper use of the harnesses. Uh, harnesses must fit and be worn properly. It must be the correct size. You know, a guy, my frame here, I'm a pretty thin guy. You know, I use a small or medium harness. If you hand me an extra large, I'm going to be swimming and it's not going to protect me. Uh, and the type and purpose. There's different types of harnesses depending on the type of work that you're doing. You know, a window cleaner is not going to wear the same type of thing as a tower climber who's not going to wear the same thing as the guy that's working out of the JLG lift. Okay. Uh, some key things here. You always want to make sure your uh, back D-ring is in between the shoulder blades. Leg straps are tight enough. Shoulder straps are all tight, so it's all snug. It shouldn't be snug, so snug you can't stand up straight, but it should fit your body properly. So we're just going to look at a few uh, photos here. Some of the things you find uh, as part of what you're supposed to be doing with your personal fall equipment is make sure you're inspecting it every day before you put it on. And these are some common things that I've found uh, out in the field and stuff like that where you need to be retiring this equipment and getting some new stuff. So. Broken stitching, 
You can see fraying and burns there. And some more fraying. You know, this, this rubber piece right here, it might not seem that important, but it helps keep everything where it's supposed to be in the event of a fall. So you start getting that, you need to go ahead and replace the equipment as well. Some more frays. You know, dirt and grime, looks like there could be some grease on there as well. You know, that, that dirt, it gets in between the fibers of the harnesses. And so as you're wearing it and moving around, that dirt actually acts like sandpaper on the straps and it actually wears it down and it's, it's kind of where it wears it down and you don't even realize how bad it is uh, until it fails. So always keep your equipment clean. Okay, this is caused by putting the harness up wet too many times. Okay, you gotta make sure you put them up dry. Don't just stick them in a bucket, okay? Some more rust there. Same type of thing. It's another harness there, but same type of thing. You know, guys work out in their harnesses when it's raining or other types of wet conditions. Just make sure you give them a clean, dry place to hang stuff up. Moving on to connecting devices. Um, there's lots of different ones of those and they also have inspection requirements as well um, and rating requirements. So you gotta make sure this stuff is properly rated. Okay, you don't wanna use rock climbing stuff out in the workforce. Um, one of the common types of ratings that you'll see on uh, connecting devices are the kilonewton. And how do you know if it's rated for enough kilonewtons? Well, one kilonewton is equal to about 225 pounds of force. So if it needs to be rated for 5,000 pounds, which it does, you look for at least 22.2 kilonewtons to meet that requirement. Um, all the gates are required to be rated for 3,600 pounds. And then you always gotta look at your sources. Where are you getting this equipment from? Uh, a few years back, there was a big issue where there was a, another company that was creating fake Crosby's. Uh, it would look very similar to the genuine Crosby's, but they weren't. And people were buying it from other companies that, you know, online sales and stuff like that, and they weren't the real things, and they were failing. All right, so I have a couple of photos here to show you guys, kind of a couple of uh, common things to check for when connecting devices are going bad. Uh, this is a self-closing uh, carabiner here, and this is an old school one. You can't use these anymore, but it has a screw lock on it. Uh, they'll have to be auto-locking now. But this one won't even shut its own gate properly anymore. You have any either of these issues here, you need to go ahead and get rid of that and replace it. And here's another common thing here. This thing has been side-loaded, uh, so the gate doesn't even, doesn't even line up properly with the hook anymore. And that was actually taken off of a, uh, a uh, six foot lanyard. Uh, it's not, it wasn't meant to be used as the way it was. So a requirement of personal fall rest system, uh, it needs to reduce the resting forces to less than 1800 pounds. And the way they kind of came up with that number is there was a French study back in the 1970s. Um, 2700 pounds is kind of the threshold of where people really got injured and where people, you know, survived all right. Uh, Canada then elected to do an 1800 pound limit and since then that's kind of where it's been. Uh, hasn't been any reported deaths or serious injuries associated with arresting an ac uh, accidental fall. So another component here, uh, I've seen a lot more place nowadays are self-retracting lifelines. Uh, very handy tools that can kind of clean up the clutter if you might. Uh, whereas, you know, the ropes and stuff like that, they kind of lay across workplaces and can cause some trip hazards and things of that nature. But they've got them in so many different forms now where you can use them. And, uh, like, you know, they, they, you can use these on peaks of roofs now. And these here work great when you're working out of lifts and other situations like that. Horizontal lifelines. Um, see those pretty commonly as well. And a lot of times when I'm seeing them now, uh, it's something where somebody took a rope and stretched it between a couple of anchor points and you can't do that, okay? Your horizontal lifeline, horizontal lifeline shall have drawings and or specifications prepared by or under the direction of an engineer. So you can't just take a couple of things and throw something together and say, oh, here's my horizontal lifeline. So you gotta make sure you buy an engineered system. Vertical lifelines, there's a few different types of those out there. And they make uh, sending and descending 
very easy to stay 100% protected from falls. Um, there's rope solutions, there's wire solutions. So you're going to see a lot more of these wire solutions on a lot of the ladder safety systems with the new requirements that are out. And here's just a couple examples of these. So it used to be you could use a cage and that was kind of your ladder safety system. Those are going away and now soon you're going to need to actually have a ladder safety system like this. And it's either a rail or a wire, something like that. And you can keep the cages on there. You don't have to remove the cages as long as it doesn't interfere with the ladder safety system. So here's some more examples there. And there's one with the, the cage still on there and the ladder safety system going right up the center there. It's not interfering with it, so it's okay. You also need to delineate your connecting devices and your, your straps and all that stuff between material handling and safety. You know, if you're an employer that's in the industry where you, know, you guys are flying things up with cranes or boom trucks or any kind of rigging like that, you don't want people using the same straps and the same rigging that they're using for moving materials as they're using the tie off. So I'm not saying you gotta go out and buy some fancy carabiners that are painted or, or anything like that, but you need to figure out a way to make sure that people are delineating between that. So next I wanna talk about calculating your fall distance. Okay, you might have somebody that's working say like a 12 foot platform here, and he's got a three foot lanyard attached to the vertical lifeline. You might be like, oh, there's no way this guy's gonna hit the ground. Only a three foot lanyard, he's up 12 feet. So I'm gonna show you a few things to think about. That three foot lanyard, because it's hanging down here, by the time he falls, before it starts to catch, he's fallen six feet. And then, let's say there's a shock pack on that three foot lanyard. Well, that shock pack's gonna break out and there could be another three and a half feet of elongation on that shock pack. Now let's take into account the height of the employee because we've been measuring from the D-ring on the back of the harness the whole time. Say he's a, you know, a, a average guy, you know, or, or maybe shorter than average, I don't know, five and a half feet from that D-ring to his feet. Then, Let's say we've got that rope rigged up kind of high and maybe there's four feet of stretch in that rope. It can happen. It's not unreasonable. Now he's fallen 19 feet off that 12 foot platform before his equipment caught him. And that's not it. We're we'll going to look at sitting into the harness. You know, before the guy falls, his back D ring is going to be back down here behind his shoulder blades. So what we have there, let's add another foot just for that. So 20 feet in the hall, this employee could fall off a 12 foot platform with a three foot landing. So just think about that. Digging into uh, descent, rescue and retrieval of a fallen worker, um, don't count on the fire department. Don't count on outside services to be able to rescue somebody when they're sitting there hanging in the harness. Okay, OSHA requires employees to provide prompt rescue for an employee in the event of a fall. Uh, there are different types of rescue techniques out there. Um, Self-rescue, a lot of times you can do that, um, but you might not be able to. You know, if, you know, picking up somebody that's unconscious in his harness is picking up dead weight. They're not helping you out at all. That's pretty hard to do. Um, so you might be able to do that, but I wouldn't count on it. Uh, manual rescue, same type thing. Winch rest, you know, using a winch if you have one on site, you know, that could be a viable option. Um, Ascending and descending devices. There are a lot of uh, tools out there now that can help you with that. I'm going to show you a few of those in a minute. Outside services, don't count on them being available, but it could be an option. And sometimes if, if you need to do it, if it's the best option you have, you know, if there's heavy equipment and you can get people down uh, quickly that way and do it safely, then that might be a better option. So back to that you know, prompt rescue, how prompt is prompt. So, um, Air Force study, we kind of had people sit in their harnesses for a little while just to see how long they could do it before they had adverse health effects, and that was 12 to 15 minutes. Okay, and that was followed by, um, you know, unconsciousness, or it could be death in, as left as in less than 30 minutes. Okay, if you don't have your stuff together, if you haven't figured out your rescue plan ahead of time, that time's going to go by real quick. Okay. Uh, how do you get more time? It might not be possible. Okay. If you don't have a plan, you know, it might take you 10 minutes to get together a plan. And then, you know, you're five minutes away from 
and have an adverse health effects. Okay, and that's on a good case scenario. Uh, there are, if the fallen employee is still conscious, there are some things that can kind of help where he can step into it, say like a rope ladder or a strap or something like that, where he can kind of step into it. Because what happens the most is down at your legs, it starts cutting off that blood flow through your legs and you know, it can cause blood clots and other things like that. But that's kind of the, the thing there. So if you can stand up into something and relieve that tension and that pressure there, it can help give you a little bit more time. But again, the employee has to be conscious and that's not always the case. Uh, so these are just a few different types of rescue devices. Uh, you know, you've got the uh, pickoff straps and uh, this is a Petzl ID. Um, that's a great tool for descending. You know, important thing is find what kind of rescue devices work for your type of situation. Have them in a kit ready to go, not buried in the back of a truck or in some closet that's locked. And always have it available wherever employees are exposed to falls. Um, and then you always want to practice your rescue plan. You know, we used to practice them every year. Every employee would play the rescuee and the rescuer and just make sure everybody was very familiar with the system. You'll find a lot of errors in the system that way too and making sure you get all those worked out when you practice. So now what if you have a plan, but there's something on site that could possibly work a little better than your actual plan? You know, say your plan is gonna take a, a little bit longer than what you want it to, but hey, there's you know a piece of equipment there on site that could get the guy down quicker. Okay, the important thing is getting the guy down quicker. Okay. There's a lot of environmental things I want you to think about as well when you're putting together your personal fall arrest system. Um, you know, you have tornado, you know, wind issues, you know, a wind on a vertical lifeline can make it jam up and it won't work properly. So you might want to look at a different type of vertical lifeline, like a cable instead of a rope. Um, sun makes things deteriorate, salt water, uh, snow and ice make things not work as well as it's supposed to. Uh, rust, from water, so just think about those things, as well as you know, dirt and dust, sharp edges, burns, things like that. They're all things you want to look at your work site and make sure that you're looking at those type of concerns and addressing them as needed. Uh, so sharp edges, you know, this is a steel cable here, and you can see a sharp edge even affects those. So you always want to protect those. Some more things there. and. You know, these are simple ways to protect these here, and you don't always have to buy an engineered system. Sometimes you can just take, you know, something as simple as a rubber hose and cut a slit in it and feed your rope through that, and that can help provide a lot of protection there. So this is just a quick list. You know, it's fairly inclusive, but I'm not going to say it's all inclusive. Different things you want to look at when you're inspecting your equipment. And all components are supposed to be inspected before each use. So feel free to screenshot this or whatever, but have a list of things to look for. It's train your employees on that so they know what to look for. Um, so another inspection requirement is annually. Um, somebody other than the user needs to be inspecting it. Once a year, we used to have all the employees bring all their equipment in and you know other people, managers, safety director, will look at each piece of equipment himself to make sure you know, it's another set of eyes inspecting the equipment. Uh, and manufacturers sometimes have their own inspection requirements, uh, you know, be six months, two years, or something like that, where it might be something you might have to send the equipment into the manufacturer. So always check the manufacturer's directions. Or the mom, manufacturer's owner's manual. You can find a lot of useful information there. Excuse me. Um, any equipment that is in need of a scheduled uh, maintenance it needs to be taken out of service until it gets that maintenance as well. Uh, cleaning. So not only does clean your work better, but it lasts longer. Talked a little bit about what happens when the dirt gets in between the fibers of your ropes and your webs and stuff like that. It really works like sandpaper in between that stuff. So a lot of the time you can just use like mild disc detergent and a brush and just kind of clean it up, rinse it off, hang it up to dry. Uh, but you want to check, again, with the manufacturer's owner's manual. Um, there might be specific requirements. And you typically want to avoid anything like WD-40 on the metal components and things like that because it'll actually attract more dirt and dust and cause rust and things of that nature. 
And, you know, they might have something that's like, you know, white lithium or graphite, but check the owner's manual. Call the manufacturer if you can't find the information there. So, you know, thinking about storage, you don't want to be throwing your harness in the back of this or trying to pull your harness out of the back of this. Okay, there's going to be tools that are falling on it, um, crushing things. It's going to damage the equipment. It's not going to last in years long. I'm not saying you got to do anything this elaborate here, but you should have something where they can hang freely. You know, they can dry if they're wet, you're not getting stuff thrown on top of them. These are just a couple of different standards you can look at uh, for some more information there on fall protection or contact InSafe. Uh, show you a few more photos, just some things, you know, used to see some of these things a lot more commonplace, but like this right here, you know, this doesn't meet our anchorage requirements, okay? So we shouldn't be seeing things like this anymore out in the field. You know, is there something wrong here? Is this being used as the manufacturer said it was supposed to be used? Actually, yes, this one is. Um, all right, but you always want to check with it. You know, if I walked up on a job site and I didn't have the directions and I saw this, I would be questioning it. You know, let me see the owner's name. Okay, so we have guys here that are using this horizontal lifeline with some ropes that stretched across here. Is that okay? Is that an engineered system? Doesn't really look like it to me. That's not the way you're supposed to be using that rope. Okay, this is a rooftop here, and we've got some... Uh, some uh, repelling lines or some, some control descent lines and some fall arrest lines. And we've got one, two, three, four sets of rope, eight total ropes tied onto the stairway. Is that stairway rated for this? Is this a proper anchor point? Okay. I would say not. I don't think there's 20,000 pounds there. Can you hang four pickup trucks off that? I wouldn't do it. So, Things to look at. Okay, remember employees are supposed to be prevented from hitting the ground below, right? So that look like that's gonna work. If that guy falls, I think he might run out of lanyard at ground level. Okay, so this is only the beginning. This is a real high overview. Um, there's a lot of different components when you're looking at fall protection systems. So again, uh, if you want more information, feel free to contact InSafe. Uh, our services are cost free. We'll do on site consultations. And, uh, you know, we can look at programs, we can provide training. And that's it. Thank you for joining.